Okay, we are here talking with Matthew Baldwin, an official in the European Commission, the executive arm of the European Union, and the European Coordinator for Road Safety and Sustainable Urban Mobility. He is also the mission manager for the project to have 100 climate neutral cities in the EU by 2030. Not far from now, that's wonderful. Thank you for- It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it, Annika? Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it really is. But thank you for being here to talk. I'm excited to talk with you. I was really intrigued to learn about your role um, last year at the Climate Summit. Oh, so yeah. let's just dive right in with the first question. So there was a bit of buzz. Um, anybody could look up the, some really great articles um, about the Transport Day for the 26th UN Climate mm. Change Conference. Uh, the, the buzz was that there was a striking absence of focus on walking and cycling, as well as I understand public transit in the agenda for Transport Day, and that it was thanks to campaigning efforts of some walking, cycling organizations, as well as a last minute intervention by you, that the declaration has a mention now of active travel. So why was it excluded in the first place or mm -hmm. absent? Uh, how long have you got, Annika? I mean, I I, I don't know is, the, is the, the short answer as to why it was excluded in the in the first place. I think I think what was going on was that the uh, United Kingdom, which was hosting the conference, you know, rightly wanted to create more themes uh, out of the COP process. So they had a theme on forestry management and finance, and and they I mean I think it's good they chose a theme on transport. But then I think the mistake, if I could put it that boldly, was to make it all about the provision of um, electric vehicles. And if you look at the whole climate puzzle and de delivering a genuinely sustainable mobility in the future, electric vehicles are part of that puzzle, certainly outside towns and cities, but they are by no means the full answer. And if you look at our towns and cities, um, I think uh, uh, most advocates would say that we are far too car dependent and we have not done nearly enough to develop our public transport, uh, walking, our cycling facilities. And, and so that's why I think um, the community, if I can put it that way, uh, was so up in arms. And I really stress uh, the, the efforts were made by them and they were terrific. I mean, they were out there in force, the walkers and the cyclists and the public transport folks. And I think they really made a difference. And the UK uh, at the end decided to bring a short reference into the declaration. So again, electric vehicles necessary, but, but not uh, by no means sufficient. And I think we, we do need to think hard ahead of the next meeting in Sharm el Sheikh how to bolster that uh, reference. I would include rail, by the way, in that as well as yes. part of a, an overall systemic uh, uh, approach to sustainable mobility. <clears throat> Absolutely. Really briefly, was it difficult to get it included? Um, well, I agenda? would love to be the hero in this and say that, you know, I, so 24 hours I negotiated you know hand-to-hand -hand combat <laughs> and all that happened was they made a lot of noise and a really effective noise i was um, given the chance to speak in the plenary and i made a reference to the need to include this and then afterwards it was included in the, in the text and so people i think wrongly assumed that it was my brilliant uh, intervention but um um so i i can't i don't think i can claim much credit um although i'm very pleased that it happened Right, of course. Um, that's props to all the groups that were there campaigning so hard. I mean, so, it was amazing to see them all. I mean, Tyler <laughs> tramping the corridors, you know, Walk 21, uh, the International Federation of Pedestrians, uh, European Cyclist Federation, um, from here in European Union, Polis, uh, uh, another very active group, the, U the UITP, the Public Transport Global Body, they were all here, in, uh, here there in force. Mm -hmm. That's great. <clears throat> okay, so across Europe, um, many municipalities mm. are activating their sustainable urban mobility plants with um, clear agendas to make cities more walking and cycling friendly for and equitable for all types of mm. movers, right? Um, so it, it was striking that it was absent from the, this um, conference initially. Um, so moving forward, uh, you noted on Twitter, I saw a Twitter post by you, a really great post, that cities are the magic ingredient to help deliver the tough challenges ahead in the EU Green Deal. I'd love to hear more about that, about cities as the magic ingredient, and then also about citizen participation. Well, thank you. Um, uh, I'd love to talk about my Twitter feed. No one's watching out there. <laughs> they so sure are. <laughs> That's Baldwin Matthew underscore. That's what people yeah. say when trying to become influencers, isn't it? Uh, um, thank you for picking up on this. 
my take on the, the climate change negotiations is, uh, and this is a personal take, not necessarily the one of the European Commission, which I work for, is that you've got a global problem called climate change, and it's negotiated at national level and because we live in a Westphalian system, right? And that's the, the basis we've chosen on these annual COPs. But implementation is going to be uh, done at a local, regional, city level. And so that's the conundrum. Um, you have the classic tragedy of the commons with you know, people who are quite happy to free ride on the negotiations at national level. Um, but at the meantime, all the people who are going to have to do this uh, are uh, hammering at the door saying, excuse me, we're the guys who are actually going to be doing this, uh, uh, the cities, the, the towns, the villages across, across the world. Um, and, and I personally feel that they need more space in the declaration. Another thing that was missing in the declaration for a long time was a reference to subnational entities, and that had to be fought in as well. So coming to cities, which is a particular focus for me, they really are the magic ingredient because cities can go furthest and fastest, and they'll be the, the, the quickest guys, <coughs> excuse me, out of the block. You know, they're at the crossroads between policy and people, right? They're the ones who are saying, we need you to refurbish your apartment. Um, <laughs> to meet our energy efficiency targets. We need you to rethink taking your kid to school uh, every day. And you know, when you're not a bad person for wanting to do so, but we need to rethink our mobility. And here are some alternatives for you to do that, including maybe walking with your kid to school if it's, uh, if it's not so far. In, even in the Netherlands, which is a great mobility country in many ways, one third of the trips of less than five kilometers are done by car. So they too, we all have progress to do. We all have things which we could improve on. And we don't, and this is a very important lesson here for climate change, we don't all have to be perfect instantly. We have to improve what we're doing by, again, incentives uh, 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 to, to, to make our behavior uh, different. We need to you know, eat less meat, drive our cars less, take less flights. And if we all do a bit of that, we're going to start making more rapid progress. Anyway, that's not quite what you were asking about. <clears throat> no, but the no. disconnect about the role of the cities. The cities I mean, were everywhere. And it was very inspiring because I went there to talk to mayors and I met loads of them from across the world and they are so determined to make a difference. Right, um, at Pedestrian Space, um, one of our main focuses is, is media and communication about walkability. So I find it really exciting to look at, well, globally, but since we're focused on Europe right now, looking at mm. also municipal media campaigns to get people thinking about their, um, you know, their their mobility. I think these are really great examples, also of cities um, communicating with with their inhabitants, like the Brussels campaign for walking by foot. Oh yeah, um, fantastic campaign. Yeah, really. There's some really clever really stuff. Viral. It went viral, yeah, right? Yeah. Big props to the Brussels region for that. I mean, wonderful campaign, and um, yeah, it made me laugh, which is a great trick and uh, mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, so I'm really interested in the, we're really interested in that piece of the puzzle too, but also um, in citizen engagement, which you also mentioned citizen participation. So what, do you have any ideas? What is your vision for citizen participation for mission of climate neutral? I know this is kind of a huge question and can't be covered in a few minutes, but some ideas yeah. or some thoughts. Well, yeah, I, I mean, maybe just to say a word about that you kindly mentioned in introducing me uh, at the start, Tanika, um, this, this mission, uh, like sounds like a mission to Mars, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, is to have 100 climate neutral and smart cities across the EU by 2030. We're right in the middle now of um, uh, in, uh, the, the, the call for expression of interest closes on Monday at five o'clock. So I suspect by the time you, you air this, the deadline will have passed. Um, and we are looking for cities from across Europe to join that and, and, and come forward and say, we are going to work with you to develop plans and investment plans to make our cities fully climate neutral by 2030, which is a big ask given uh, the challenges that lie ahead. And as part of that, we are saying humbly, not because we know all the answers in the European Commission, that we ask cities to come up with plans for citizen participation. Why? Because if you look at the cities that are doing it, and there are a handful across Europe, uh, Copenhagen, um, Leuven down the road, you can't achieve it without citizens' participation. You know, you, you get, a, a, I think you used the phrase earlier, Annika, a disconnect between what you're trying to achieve at European national or even the city level and the individual citizen who's got to be ready to make the changes 
but also ready to appreciate the benefits, the co-benefits that come. I mean, in tackling these invisible gases that are around us, this existential challenge we have to do, the miracle is that we get better air quality, reduce deaths and injuries uh, from road crashes. We reduce the noise. Um, we will get, I believe, lower energy bills and better energy security uh, from <coughs> taking the measures to deliver this climate neutrality. So these are the things we need to discuss with the citizens to bring forward. Well, not we, the, the cities need to. And, and it's not a top down process. It's not us saying to Naples and Gothenburg, right, here's the model you must follow, because mm. guess what? It's going to be very different how you consult. Um, uh, cities in Poland or, or Italy or, or, or wherever it is. So leaving it to the city to decide how to do that, but strongly encouraging that this must be part of the process. It must be exciting for you to also see all the all the um, ideas that come in and all and how they it's are all adapted. Amazing. To different. Yeah, it's really amazing. It's amazing. I know you, you were previously <clears throat> living in, in Sweden, you were telling me earlier, Annika, and uh, they've taken this concept we, we've picked up on, this idea of a climate city contract. And, and just to give you one example of that, in Gothenburg, they have multiple contracts within the city. Um, the city itself has a contract with its citizens saying, this is what we're going to try to do and how. And then you have citizens living in public housing and they've got a contract, uh, how they're working to deliver climate neutrality. And then in private housing and then elderly citizens have got their own contract. It's, it's fabulous to see. And you know, a thousand flowers, are, I was going to say literally, but that's the wrong use of the word literally, a, a thousand flowers are metaphorically <laughs> blooming on this across Europe as we speak. <clears throat> that's really exciting. I, I really like what you said too about citizens. It's about being able, being ready to make the changes, but also being ready to benefit from them. And this brings me back. I asked you some, some weeks ago about your definition of walkability. And if you don't mind, I want to read Did it because I, I think it's Yes, you did. So tell me what it was. I, I, pub <laughs> I published it too. Um, you're a busy man. Uh, defining walkability, you wrote, a walkable city is a living city, a livable city, a lovable city. It's a city where there is space and time to breathe and the air is fit to breathe. But don't think a walkable city becomes walkable by itself. The necessary space and the priority have to be given to pedestrians. I think that's a wonderful definition. Genius. By, uh, Whoever yeah. came up with that is genius. I mean, I think if you ask anybody on a different day, it could change, but I think that is a really good essence. And I think that is the idea too, for um, citizens being ready to enjoy the benefits. Some, some citizens don't know. I didn't really experience walkable urbanism myself until I was 21. Many people don't know what they don't know, right? That's quite weird. But I mean, what I also like to say is that more than cycling and driving or and whatever it is, uh, skateboarding, everyone is a pedestrian. Yep. I mean, even the guy who drives, and it is probably a guy who drives his car right up to his carport, he's still got to walk or waddle to the kitchen, right? I mean, right. So, sorry, I don't want to be pejorative. That's not a pejorative. That's I not, mean, but that's not a walkable everyone, lifestyle. It's not, but I mean, the point is that everyone can do it. You don't need yep. special equipment to go out and do it. And everyone pretty much does do it, even if it's going to the shops. And so I've always failed to understand why we've not managed to get this ubiquity of walking mm -hmm. more into the mainstream. I mean, I'm sure that's what you're wrestling with too. And, it's, <clears throat> and I'm, a, I'm a keen cyclist, but I, I often think that walking suffers in comparison to cycling in a way which is, which is unnecessary and, and unfair, frankly. So... You know, the bike has become the, the emblem of green mobility and why not the, the foot? <laughs> I think because per personally, I think it's a bit because of this assumption that everybody does the walking. For me though, I grew up very car dependent. Driving home and parking in my garage and walking in the house is very different than for example, my first experience of living in a walkable urban lifestyle where I, I didn't have a car and I walked everywhere. That is a very different lifestyle than yeah, driving into my garage and then leaving every day via my garage, you know? So that yeah. actually connects to my next question. Um, Sorry, yeah. There's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a uh, November 2021 Eurostat report, passenger mobility statistics that reported that the car is the dominant mode of transport in the EU still with less than two persons on average per car. Um, and feel, feel free to check my stats later on this. Um, I'm always happy to be updated with good statistics. While the EU has a wealth of walkable urban environments, as well as many best practices for cycling culture and infrastructure, the car is in many places still king as mobility choice. So what do you, I'm asking for your personal opinion really, um, what do you view as the challenges related to car dependence in Europe over the coming decade, or we can say eight years up until 2030? Wow, thanks for 
fishing out those stats from your stat uh, report and i mean that's correct um it, it, it we are still living in a car dominated and car dependent culture um as is you know most of the world and and if you like one worrying thing is that uh, a large part of the world is going to become car dependent i mean we are forecasting i think an additional 1 billion vehicles on the world's roads by 2030 and for those of us trying to reduce deaths and serious injuries um, um, by 50% by 2030. That's a daunting figure to go up against because, I mean, the overwhelming trigger for a death uh, and serious injury is, is the fact of collision with a motorized vehicle. So, so why, uh, to, rather than um, to just uh, talk about it, why, why is that happening and what are, what are the challenges? I think it's, we have constructed not just our mobility systems but our cities and our uh, transport structures uh, too much around the car it needn't be um it needn't be left that way i mean many of the same structures that we built uh, can then be used very easily and comfortably by active mobility and and uh, light rail and, and trams and bus systems so it's not a life sentence uh, it's a fixable problem but we have constructed it. And then I think there is a tendency to say, oh, let's do that. And particularly in the United States, where I understand you come from, you, you have these very linear cities, which make it quite difficult uh, uh, to, to, to get to access without, without a, a car. And, and so there's a structural element to it. Secondly, I think we build our overall systems around it. I often use the example of someone who's coming um, from a, a town outside Brussels. Why do they drive their car every day into Brussels to work? Um, knowing they're going to be in traffic jams, knowing you know that they're causing costs to everybody with their actions, and the answer is the system we give them. The huge tax advantages for company cars, uh, shared between uh, the company and the individual. Um, public transport, and the Belgians would be the first to say this, is not what it could be. So the train is not always a viable alternative. And then you often get free parking when you arrive at your place of work. So yeah. it makes it a perfectly rational choice to drive your car. And we've got to fix that system. The person who does it is not a bad person. We've got to fix the, 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 the mixture of incentives that they face. Now, outside a city, I think I need to make a distinction. I think it's quite hard to see how we're going to reduce our car dependence in the very short term. I think there are large parts of, the, of, of where people live inside the European Union, which you're going to continue to need the car. And then we need to help them again by making sure that the people in those situations don't have to drive their cars all the way into the cities in order to access the city. So park and ride facilities, park and walk facilities, um, making it easier to leave your car cheaply on the outside of town and, and then to boost the commerce in the towns because we all know how much more commerce is driven by, um, by, by people on active mobility or on public transport. And then, and, and then the last point I would make is that we have to be patient, but we have to be determined. And we have now produced in the European Union a new strategy, we're calling it the Urban Mobility Framework, which says, I think, for the first time that we at the European level say that in urban mobility, the priority should be given to public transport and active mobility. And I hope that people will take that cue and we will explore together at the European level, national solutions, regional solutions, and local uh, city solutions to, to, to actually deliver on that. And again, I don't know how cities are going to be climate neutral by 2030 without reducing very dramatically that uh, car dependence, particularly the cars that are privately owned and carbon fueled. I just don't know how you're going to get there if, if you're not serious about that. Right. I'm, I'm glad you made a distinction too. I recently moved from the heart of a very walkable city um, to the fringes of a to the fringes of a walkable city, but very car, I'm in a very car dependent area right now. And, and I ride the bus into the city, there's one bus and it's always full. It's 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 always that, full. That's telling. Then it's, goes it's the very telling. Yeah, yeah. It's a very car dependent urban periphery, but I notice no matter what hour I'm on the bus, it's full. So so there's um, a lot of rich observation there to be had that people people really depend on these modes. And Could I make one other point, sorry, which I forgot to make, which yeah, is sure. this notion of the car as a superior good. And, you know, um, car use, sorry, biking use went from 25%, uh, no, maybe wrong. I think it was 25% of all trips in the United Kingdom in 1945 to 1% 1 in 1970. And why? economic growth and the fact that people could over that time increasingly afford a car. And for all the people who come from Eastern Europe, 
for, for so many years living under communism, not being able to own a car, not having any prospect of owning a car, and suddenly you have that chance. Right. And it is, a, it is a statement about individual freedom. We have to understand that and, yeah. and, and, and not kind of rail against it as saying these people are wrong or stupid. Yeah. It is, and it's the same with cheap flights, by the way. I mean, all the people who've never been able to go and find uh, travel in other, to other countries, they've had that chance. So I think those of us who are worrying about climate change and want to promote alternative, we need to be very conscious of, of, of those, those factors, which are big cultural norms and, and not, uh, and not I'm not being very articulate, but but not not to sort of imply people are wrong wrongheaded or stupid about these. Things. Oh, absolutely. Well, I come from America. I know a lot about the car <laughs> as freedom. I mean, this is exactly how I grew up, and I the symbol of the country. <laughs> it's it's just, it's in our DNA. The road trip and the and and auto dependence is a huge part of American culture. So, yeah, I would never. And there's some. I mean, there is some chatter here. I would say that that idea has also at least the mm. culture here is also um, looks to that model. Um, <clears throat> so, well, uh, so you've already mentioned this about car dependence. Um, any other thoughts about uh, challenges for develop uh, sustainable urban mobility across Europe? I mean, like some of the really the juiciest challenges and controversies, I think reduction of car dependence is one of the biggest and most difficult. And it's also, a very, it's very, it gets into very contentious territory. When I post images of, of conversions of city in inner city areas to very walkable um, areas, it, it's not, it's usually not controversial. People love seeing those transformations. Mm -hmm. When you post images of congested highways, which is the norm across the world in metropolitan areas, it brings up all sorts of other emotions. It's a very contentious, space to have dialogue and discuss. Um, but beyond the car dependence, any other thoughts about some of our, really our biggest challenges with urban mobility? Um, uh, just just briefly on, on that one more time, I completely agree with you about that. Um, although I fail to understand why there's not greater public revulsion at the uselessness of a car jam, of, of a traffic jam. I mean, it's, yeah. it serves no purpose. Yeah. It blocks the streets, it pollutes the air, it's a waste of everyone's time, it's miserable for everyone concerned. And I don't understand, and this is a personal failing probably, why we've not managed to make this and this aesthetically appalling, time-wasting, miserable experience more of, a, more of an issue. The other right. thing about car dependence, which if you ask mayors, and I talk to a lot of mayors these days, what the one in one word is the single most controversial issue, it's parking. So yeah. it's almost not even more than restricted access for cars or creating of pedestrian areas, losing a parking space, this notion that we, we all somehow have a personal right to a piece of public property at a massive subsidy. I mean, nowhere in, in the European Union does the price of an annual parking uh, space is, it come even close to the real cost of providing that space. And but taking them away or, or putting the price back to sort of a, a, a of a more realistic level, it's a bomb. But okay, so what are the what are the challenges apart from this? I and mean, if I could mention just a couple, um, and I think this applies not just to mobility, but by the way, with the whole process of climate neutrality, is disruption, um, refurbishing buildings, constructing new uh, new pipelines, if you like, and distribution systems for sustainable energy, um, building uh, metro lines, uh, light rail. One of the risks we run, and, and I think it's a, it is a we in terms of our 100 climate neutral cities project, is the risk of cities becoming building sites for the next 10 years, uh, getting available access to building materials, uh, just to getting skilled workers to do these things. So aside from the cost and the, the lifestyle changes, a lot of short run disruption. So, I mean, all of this speaks to the need for really smart city planning, um, and I mean in the original sense of the word smart, although it can incorporate the new sense of the word smart, um, to figuring out how to do these things in a, in a, in a friendly, uh, sequenced, uh, and citizen-friendly way. Um, it's going to be a big challenge to do that. Again, I don't think we actually have much of a choice if we are serious about our climate change targets. We are going to have to adjust. We're going to have to adjust in terms of our infrastructure, and the problem is that we just have quite a lot of infrastructure to change. So I think that would be one of the other big challenges I would outline. <clears throat> That's great. And I, I like the idea of uh, how this requires really smart city planning and smart in the original sense of the word. Um, uh, speaking of that. I know the used word smart. 
as I opposed know. to stupid, right? <laughs> well, yeah. speaking to that really smart city planning, do you have some examples of projects that you would say you refer to, you think they have happened, are currently happening, are about to happen across Europe? Some really interesting examples of, of projects um, in this realm in European cities. Well, you're asking me precisely at the wrong time, Annika, in the sense okay. that the the bids from across Europe are flooding in uh, okay. as we speak, and and I'm you know talking to Lamel, I'm hearing a lot of things, but be mm -hmm. maybe interesting to have another conversation about. In fact, we could focus it specifically on ideas that have come forward about walking uh, and you know from new climate neutral cities. I can't for the life of me put a um, um, uh, to single anyone out now, but there's a lot of variations on the themes around the super blocks idea that have come out of Barcelona. Of course, lots of ideas to promote pedestrianization and, and the 10 minute or the 15 minute city and the low traffic neighborhoods. There are lots of things like that. But I mean, I would be interested to look at and to talk to you again in the future, maybe about the specific walk walkability schemes, which mm -hmm. I'm sure are gonna be there. Definitely. <clears throat> yeah, I would like to circle back on that later as well. So if you don't mind, a few personal questions. We always enjoy um, asking some personal things. If you don't mind, you can always skip, but- uh, No, that's all. Cool. Okay, Not so go let's go. Uh, what is the state of walkability in your city of residence? One to 10? Yeah, let's do one to 10. Um, six, but it used to be four. And also uh, your city of residence, just oh, so sorry, can... uh, Brussels in Belgium. Right. Um, six, but used to be four? Yeah, it's really, it's really improving a lot. Um, a lot of focusing on, on uh, I mean, there's a huge pedestrianized downtown now, which is transforming the, the central part of the city, a lot more bike lanes. Um, but um, And I think much more focus, so many of the, the, the worst um, pavements or sidewalks, as you like to call them, are provided in the poorest parts of town where fewest people have cars, which is paradoxical, right? I mean, you might think at least where, the, where there's a lower level of car ownership, you, you, know, you get good places to walk, but it's actually the other way around, which is nuts. So, I mean, I think Brussels is starting to focus a lot on that kind of stuff. Which is exciting. So it's not a 10, so it's not like a city of just ripe with best practices, but it's a city of change. So we can actually see the change happening. Um, well, I'd like to ask you, do you know any cities you'd give a 10? There are, yeah, I've seen a couple of cities that I would give an eight or a nine for sure. Um, 10, I'm skeptical because of course this is- I think is, we have to reserve for the perfect city. You do. And also, um, my 10 is not necessarily another person's 10. True. So, um, oh, no, always doing that. Completely non scientific. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, these are not. And I'm not looking when I ask this, and I do ask this across social media from the pedestrian space accounts, it's not, it's not a scientific experiment. It's really about people's personal narratives and hearing why does this person rate Brussels a six for walkability, but this one a four or a two or an eight? What are the different, the views. <laughs> right? What are the different narratives there? So what, what do you think could be done in the next couple of years to bring it up to an eight or a nine? In Brussels. Well, in a couple of years, it's probably a, probably a stretch. But um, I mean, I, well, actually, the thing I've already mentioned, I would I would have, if I if I got the chance, I would I would urge the city to look at the 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 quality of the street architecture for walking in the poorest neighbourhoods of town. If I mean, if, if the city were able to do that, I mean, the the the, pa the pavements, as I call them in, in English, English are, are too often cracked and broken. You've got signs and bins, and and too often the, the pedestrians are asked to share to share space with cyclists and and e-scooters and vice versa, putting us into conflict. And and all of these kinds of things uh, reduce the quality and the pleasure of the walking experience. And, and walking should be the least stressed, you know, uh, mode of transport of all, right? That's the moment when you can reflect and not worry about being distracted. And, you know, I think you, it's pretty hard to do that in, in Brussels right now. So that's the kind of focus I'd like to see put on, particularly in the, in the neighborhoods, you know, where, where you don't have everyone owning a car or, um, uh, and they need to walk about because it's the only way. Maybe this is where also local level advocacy groups are campaigning for, for those types of areas. That'll be interesting to look into. Um, Can I give also, the props in that context to a wonderful group here in Brussels called Heroes for Zero, yeah. which I, I, I volunteer with, but yeah, they're looking great. commune by commune exactly at that. It started out with a focus on safety, but they've become much more about advocacy for active mobility lifestyles. And they're the ones who 
who then raised directly with the commune authorities the poor quality of this uh, pedestrian crossing, the, the the issues around cycling on that street, and and uh, very very effective. Okay, great. Yeah, I like their work a lot. Um, that's great. What about public transit? Public transit is something I do view as part. It's not you can have a walkable city, I think, or a walkable town, not necessarily with public transit, but I do consider it kind of essential for any, especially metropolitan region. So what exactly. about uh, Brussels? What do you think could be done? What would you rate the public transit? I think um, uh, probably six again, um, and probably it, it hasn't as proved as much uh, as, as, uh, as walking and cycling provision. Um, um, it is it is an expensive and difficult thing to do. I don't think enough attention, I don't blame Brussels for this, but generally has give, been given to what I call multimodal connections to enable people to walk or cycle to the metro or to the railway station or to get the bus and to make it easy for them to connect. Um, we're, 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 we're doing better with digital uh, explanations and, and information, but it's not as easy as it should be. I guess this primarily applies to cycle parks and ability to take bikes on, on trains. Um, but the same is, is true for walking. And, you know, sometimes you've got, you know, bus stops or tram stops right in the middle of roads, make it quite hard to get to them. The whole issue of accessibility for um, visually impaired or, or wheelchair um, users. Uh, all of these things uh, need to be uh, looked at. And I, I mean, to be fair, are being looked at, but we need to make more progress on in, in the coming, <clears throat> coming years. Right. And finally, um, what are your prefer preferred methods of moving about um i am i'm a little bit if i'm honest a bit of an obsessive cyclist and i you know if the, the thing i mentioned earlier about too many too many trips that could be made by foot or made by car you could probably accuse me of making too many trips by bicycle that i could also make by foot that would um, be a terrible accusation well that sounds like great it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to admit but i mean i just um i i've i find it for instance easier to to do my shopping with my big panniers than to carry it back by hand. right yeah but, i said it would be a I'm, terrible I'm, accusation to say that that was problematic that doesn't sound problematic at all well i mean it, i i sometimes think i'm losing the ability to walk and i started out walking when i was a kid uh, you know going hiking on long distance footpaths so I, I i do often say you go go for a walk for goodness sake don't just get on your bike the whole time um but i mean i'm a i'm a i'm a, a walker cyclist a cyclist walker okay and well i i usually don't know i'm really not i think cycling ha has a lot of energy and momentum i'm really super focused on walkability mm -hmm. at pedestrian space but since you're quote an obsessive cyclist what's the state of cycling in brussels in terms um, of infrastructure? Well, that, that, um, I would say that's gone from a three to a seven. And I think it's very interesting. I mean, successive um, uh, transport ministers for the region have really put the focus on it. And I mean, I, I, you're more focused on, on walking and I'd be interested to hear, you know, this whole notion of what is a biking city and people kind of go, oh, Co Copenhagen and mm -hmm. Amsterdam. And then they say, well, you know, my city couldn't, it couldn't do that. You know, it's too hilly, too dusty, too rainy, too cold, too hot. And, and then looking at what Paris has done and is doing mm -hmm. and what Brussels is starting to do and is doing, I think you can really challenge that notion. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's no such thing as a city that isn't walkable or a city that isn't bikeable. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what the, the, the two things we should really dig our heels in, if you like, those of us advocating for active mobility, is to say, no, politely, that's not right uh, to say that we can't improve uh, you know, walking or, you know, this American city is culturally opposed to walking. It was not always a city dominated by cars and it right. need not be again in the future. And, and so, and, and the last thing I would say, and I'm very sorry, I have to run off in a moment, mm -hmm. um, is, is a plea, which I make a lot for walking and cycling groups to work better together, to be in alliance with each other, with public transport advocates. Um, because if you like, this is under the umbrella of sustainable urban mobility. This is what together will transform our cities. And it, 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 and it, it upsets me to hear um, walkers saying, and I don't understand, I'm not condemning them, oh, the bloody cyclists, you know, everywhere, or the cyclists saying, oh, the bloody walkers clogging up my routes. For goodness sake, let's do better at working together. Right. That's a good that's a good note to end on. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for asking me these great questions and all power to you with this uh, new website and new scheme and it looks fascinating and I'd love to stay in touch. Okay. Um
Let's see, I'm just going to stop recording really quick.